Now, on Philadelphia's number one college radio station, WHIP, Rational Radio. Temple University, you are tuned into Beyond the Lead right here on Wednesday afternoons from 3 to 4. This is Joseph Williams, obviously alongside Ryan Frischella, and we will be discussing a couple Temple News articles today that have been making waves around campus, shall we say. So Making our, waves? <laughs> making wow, waves. look at that intro. <laughs> uh, our, our, uh, the first article we will be discussing was written by Leanne Parsons, who is in the studio with us today. Leanne, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. And um, your article discussed, you know, the potential of a task force, I guess, being introduced um, concerning the potential off-campus stadium, you know, what what would it be used for other than just football? Football season does not go year-round. As a matter of fact, we'll probably only have, what, roughly like five to six games maybe per year yeah so, um could you just give like a little basic background of what your article entailed sure so uh president theobald um tasked uh jeremy jordan um with putting together a task force of about 15 16 people to talk about potential other uses for this proposed on-campus stadium um and some of these uh, people are from um, faculty senate, from different uh, schools around uh, campus. So there's some designers from Tyler. Um, there's people from athletics, um, and trying to get a, a broad um, range of perspectives. Uh, and so these people are looking at other uses, like maybe classroom space, maybe a research facility, um, maybe. Um, other events other than football stadium, uh, football games. Um, and right now they've only had, uh, since I, this article came out, they might have met one more time, but from what I've been told, they've only met twice so far. Interesting. And so going through the uh, kind of the research and then writing process of this article, um, is this any way involving the community? at all in this or is this strictly like a, a temple internal kind of survey to figure out uh, the, the most amount of uh, uses that we can get out of this, this site? Well, when I was speaking to um, my various sources listed in the article, you know, Ryan Rinaldi and Trisha sure. Jones, who is faculty senate president, um, they do have people from uh, community relations on the task force, but they do not have community members. Uh, and the reason this is is, well, they told me that um, right now it's because they're looking at what Temple University specifically needs. Um, so like an, like another research facility, like the community doesn't need a research facility, but the university does. Um, and that's the reasoning that I was I was told. And that's a little mm. interesting that they'd be considering a research facility in a football stadium. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate on that a little yeah. bit? Like, it, if, if you know anything yeah, about you know anything what... about that concussion study. Yeah, so things like um, concussion studies. I know that's been a really big thing in national news recently. Um, all these things coming out about football players um, developing early onset Alzheimer's and things like that because of um, impact to their heads. Um, but I was also told that They've looked at a couple other stadiums across the country and what, what other things they have within them. Um, so they've looked at Tulane University. They've looked at Cincinnati. They've looked at, I think, um, Texas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and some of them do have alternate spaces, so classroom space and um, mm -hmm. places where like their band can practice year-round. Okay, so um, the first thing that came to mind when discussing, I guess, community relations is that um, I guess I don't know if this is just a rumor or if it was really something concrete that, you know, if, if slash when the stadium um, does go up, it could be used for, you know, maybe like high school football games or high school graduation, something with more like local schools. So I guess that was that discussed um, in your reporting or not? 
Not that specifically. Okay. Um, I do believe that that's a potential usage for it for high school games and for graduations and other um, community events. Mm -hmm. um, but this was not discussed in the article that I know for, and you know, not that I know that those will be used for certain. Right now, what I keep hearing is that a lot of it is up in the air. The conversation is very quote unquote raw. That's what Ryan Rinaldi, uh, you know, student body president, has said to me um, quite a few times. Um, and so with a lot of missing, I guess, fill in the blanks, missing mm -hmm. pieces, it's kind of hard to decide because also they mentioned that um, we don't know what the stadium's going to look like yet. We don't know, right. you know, since it hasn't even been approved, we don't know how much space it's going to actually have, what the structure is going to be, um, if there is indeed going to be enough built in for alternate uses other than games. Um, so a lot of these questions still have to be answered. And with the approval of um, uh, Moody Nolan, the architect, yeah. um, w we might start to see some new developments within the next you know, few months or but throughout the next year. And so there's, you go on to talk about here about the uh, feasibility study that has been already approved, that uh, $1 million to kind of explore <laughs> you know the the location what the impact would be kind of all that good stuff um and then there's this quote um from let's see what's his name um from jeremy jordan i was gonna call him jerry jordan the uh teachers union <laughs> president yeah um and it says, unless somebody comes up with a lot of money in a really nice space in Philadelphia, they're going to give us to build a stadium in a different way. We just don't have that many options left. It's not wide open the way we initially thought it was. What do you mean by that quote? Um, that was actually Trisha Jones. Uh, faculty, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, faculty Center president. And she was saying that when the idea of a stadium on-campus stadium first came out initially um, people had thought that that was only one idea out of many um, you know one of them could be staying with uh, the Eagles you know renting out the link one of them could be finding alternate space one of them could be you know going elsewhere and then it was you know out of a variety of options but as we've looked at the rise of rent for the link and um, and the task force and other people who are working on um, the progress of the on-campus stadium, there aren't a whole lot of other options. The rent has increased quite a lot um, and looking at other spaces in Philadelphia where we have you know a stadium sized area for our football team to play, there's not there isn't really anything around and so as the options have narrowed down again like she had said it's not as wide open as we had thought initially where we had this whole range of options and now it doesn't look like we have as many options as maybe we had thought before after all this research and such has been done that's interesting because i didn't even think there were that many options to start with i Neither thought it was I. either i thought it was the link <laughs> on campus or like not at all i guess which doesn't really make sense. So the third option doesn't even really count. Um, but I just think that that's, that's fascinating. Um, I don't know, because I, I feel like should the link, you know, decrease the rent, I feel like that's a very feasible option. You know, we were just talking about this on the last show in the handoff. I don't think that 35,000 seats is, go is enough. Like, I, I, I feel like it's kind of like, like, Hey, kind of hastily thrown together, right? Like, we want a stadium. This is what we can afford. 35,000 seats it is. Notre Dame, I mean, Link holds 69,000 people. The game was sold out with standing room only. Right. There were more than 69,000 people there. And with this, you're going to have, you know, just 35,000 people. I think, I think that's interesting. And then to go through all this just for that. Leanne, do you want to give your input on that? Do, do, you, do you have anything to say? 35,000? Is it a... Is it a sweet spot? I mean, obviously, we're in a city where in North Philly we don't have that much space to begin with. So I guess you can use this time to, you know, insert a little bit more of your own personal opinion on this whole stadium, you know, brouhaha, whatever is going on with that. <laughs> I always want to say that on air. Um, you know, what, what do you, what do you think about trophy, the Joe. whole thing? Yeah, thank you. 
Um, well, I personally have not been following the sports aspect of it. I do know, obviously, we've had a great season this past past year, um, and that certainly has contributed to the excitement around it. I think that having a, an on-campus stadium will improve alumni relations. It's Thank a Donor Week, and I know that the university um, could always benefit from additional um, endowments from mm. alumni, however big or small. Um, I think that for the people who are engaged in sports, this is, you know, a really exciting thing and they don't have to take, you know, transportation, take a bus, whatever, to get to um, a stadium. Um, and I think that for the university, there are a lot of upsides. There are a lot of benefits, I think, that um, if the football team continues to perform as it has this past year, um, that could be really exciting for the thirty-five thousand people who do want to right. who do want to participate in that. Um, and then, personally, and we have um, editorialized on this a few times. I think that it's very important to, as always, take the community into consideration. So many of these people have been there their whole entire lives. Generations of their family have lived here, and um, for students who are only here for about four years, it's less. kind of, or less, depending on, you know, who you, who you talk to, um, it might have not such a great impact for them, especially if they're, especially because Temple football is for Temple students but it's not necessarily the North Philadelphia football team, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the pride that many Temple students take in the football team and the enthusiasm and all of that, and alumni included, might not be translated um, for community members who are not involved in the university. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you bring that up um, because certainly we've seen and I'd say that there is some sort of, I wouldn't call it resentment, but some sort of envy by, by Temple students when they look at places like University City, right? Now, Drexel obviously doesn't have a stadium there, but Penn does. Um, University of Pennsylvania went through a period of, of intense change in that area um, that used to be almost, it was 90% black back then and uh, before Penn went through what is now referred to as pentrification. Um, and now it's only about 12% black in the area um, because of the changes that have gone through. And I think a lot of people here, um, certainly people that I've talked to, look at that and say, you know, why can't you know we be like that? Why can't we be like University City? You know how cool that would be? Um, and then that adds another, that adds another aspect to it um, because, one, I mean, you don't, you don't hear from the community anymore there because they're not there. They're gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll, wherever they wherever they've gone, I mean, who knows? I mean, Drexel is now committed, uh, I think, a, a billion dollars to building Innovation Park, a new neighborhood in West Philadelphia, um, in a neighborhood where you know Drexel dominates the surrounding Powelton Village in Mantua. I mean, it's it's not you know this is not a temple specific. I mean, certainly the. Temple's the one who wants to build the stadium, but I think many other urban universities are going through a lot of these same changes or have already gone through those changes. Um, and so I think that that's interesting to look at how they dealt with that. I know Temple sent a delegation down to Tulane. Apparently they have a very similar situation uh, when they built their stadium to what we have here. Um, but for the most part, I don't hear not necessarily uh, uh, outward support for the stadium. I, I think that I think there is maybe a quote unquote silent majority of people that maybe are for the stadium but don't say anything about it. Uh, but in just walking around I have only heard uh other than some people that I'm friends with, I have only heard like down with the stadium. And those are just my observations. Um yeah, I mean I I tend to agree with that, but I mean I don't want to insert myself that much into it. Uh we do have guests in the studio. So I mean that that does pose an interesting question, though. I mean, 
I guess from your experiences on campus, do do you feel like people um, are sort of shy to to admit that they want the stadium to be built, especially when you see um, so many people from the community protesting the stadium? Then you have like these stadium stompers, um, people you know holding like big vibrant protests and rallies against the stadium so one today at two o'clock where they walked out and yeah oh know. yeah the walkout i completely forgot about that yeah so yeah do you think you know people really are for it but they just don't want to speak up about it i think it depends who you hang out with <laughs> um i think that if you speak to um <clears throat> athletes or football players they might feel more positively, I don't. I'm, I'm personally not friends with any football players, but they might feel one way. Well, someone, um, well, many of my personal friends um, feel the opposite, and some people might sort of not really know how to feel, to be honest, because, like I said, like me, I'm fairly neutral about sports, um, and my temple pride so to speak doesn't really reside with the sports side of it i mean it's exciting it's <laughs> cool when our football team wins but i'm certainly not you know placing my the value of the school on the football team um and not that they're not a valuable contribution of course but i'm here for for other things other than sports um so there might be people who, who very much do feel that we should have a stadium, and I'm, I feel that people on both sides of the fence will be very vocal <laughs> about <Okay>. it. <laughs> um, but then I think there are a lot of people in the middle who could go who could honestly go either way, depending on what information they receive. Um, and so I personally urge everyone to stay informed, to read up in the Temple News and otherwise um, the information that's out there, and make educated and informed opinions. Um, and I think that one of the things that is valuable to think about, if you're planning on staying in Philadelphia, especially for the upcoming classes, um, planning on staying in North Philadelphia for the next four years, or even staying after you graduate, mm -hmm. whichever, an on-campus stadium would raise the rate of housing, the prices of housing. Um, and a lot of people who are in the community are indeed low income. And then students, as a general rule, were not exactly swimming in money. <laughs> so finding <laughs> yeah. affordable housing, if an on-campus stadium were to be built, would likely be a little <coughs> bit more difficult than now. And even now, we, we did a, an article on this um, a week ago, I believe, housing prices have been rising rapidly. Yeah, they've gone the through the decade. roof. Yeah. So if it's just something to take into consideration, something that even if you personally don't care about the community, you have no personal ties, you don't really, you know, it doesn't really affect you, mm -hmm. this is something that will affect you as students. Yeah. Just something to keep in mind. Great play on both sides of the argument here. Go check out the article that uh, Leanne wrote in this week's edition of the Temple News. Leanne, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move into our first break here, but be sure to stay tuned for the rest of the Beyond the Lead segment here in the Rational Radio time slot on this Wednesday afternoon. We will be right back after this. Hi, I'm Ryan Seacrest for RAD. Over 300 people in this country are killed every week by a drunk driver. That's the equivalent of two 747 plane crashes every single week. And the problem isn't going away unless we all do our part to stop it. So if you see someone who's about to drive after drinking, get the keys. Don't leave it up to anyone else. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. A public service announcement brought to you by RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters and the Ad Council. Some statistics are surprising, some are unbelievable, and some are simply unacceptable. Right now, nearly 30% of U.S. students aren't finishing high school. Nearly 30%, and that's the average. In many places, it's even higher than that. And fixing it is a responsibility that we all share. This is President Obama, and I urge everyone, not just parents, but friends and neighbors and family members, to take responsibility for encouraging the high school students in your communities, to support them, challenge them, push them a little, and do whatever it takes to help them make it through. 
because this is one statistic we simply can't afford to ignore. You can do your part by going to boostup.org and sending an email, a text message, or even a wake-up call to a student at risk of dropping out. Go to boostup.org and provide the boost that's needed to make it to graduation. A message from the U.S. Army and the Ad Council. People are always talking about the stock market, always looking to invest in a good opportunity, something with the potential to grow. So what if you could invest in the future, the future of kids, like a stock? Not the kind of stock where you invest to make money, but a stock for a social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps students like me go to college, which ends up making the future better for everybody. I could be the first college graduate in my family, the first district attorney from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there will be a second and a third. This can really be the start of something. My name is Charles, and I'm your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. A public service announcement brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. What is that? Oh, that? It's my time machine. Does it work? Sure. Just hit this button. Whoa, dinosaurs. Cool. Or we can go here. Hey, that's Napoleon. Me. Oui. Or we can go to the future. Wow, hey, you have this nice house. Do I have a nice house? No, you didn't save any money, always spent it on vacations and stuff. If only there was a way I could go back in time and correct that bad habit. Yep. Okay, the time machine is not real, but the saving thing is. Get in the habit of putting some of your money in savings each week through a 401k, savings account, or financial investments. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy tips on saving, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. What does this crazy little button do? Wait, no! This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. My name is Tom Thornton. And my name is Cindy Thornton. We've been married 38 years. We're retired, and this is how we live united. We play golf and we travel. But we also decided we were going to give to and volunteer with United Way at our community free health clinic. I do the nursing at the clinic. I work the front office, checking in patients, greeting them, making them feel comfortable. United Way is how we contribute because we know our time and money are going to the right places, the places that need it most and implement it best. Judging by the thank yous we get at the clinic, I'd say we're doing the right thing with our retirement too. We even get a few bless yous. It's incredible. We're Tom and Cindy Thornton. We volunteer at our community free health clinic. So we don't just wear the shirt. We live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Beyond the Lead here on WHIP, Philly's number one college radio station. We just finished up a very informative and detailed interview with Leanne Parsons. And now we have the second guest of the afternoon with us, ready to take over the mic, one Dominic Barone. How you feeling thank today, you. Dominic? I'm doing very well. How are you guys doing today? We're good. Real thank good. you. Glad you could join us. I am too. Real quick, I just wanted to add about something that we didn't maybe cover. You guys probably already know, but we're talking about the stadium sure. and yeah. the different uh, research facilities. Sure. Well, us and Penn are a part of the largest concussion study in history. Okay. So that is going to be a huge part of Temple curriculum. So wow. I just wanted to throw that out there. Temple and Penn accepted. Now, some schools... Because where where we see concussion studies going, not a lot of schools are so uh, hyped to take on this role mm. because they could. A lot of people would say, "Well, you're the school that promoted the downfall of football, or whatever." So it's uh, pretty it's pretty progressive for Temple and Penn to come out as the schools that could potentially put a very significant stranglehold on the concussion study 
issue along with CTE. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, sure. Uh, Definitely. Because, because I was thinking research. I'm like, what are they going to be doing? Like, like, like largest... computer science research in the football stadium or something like that? And I, I was would, like, I would have to it say, makes sense. I would have to say, Moody Nolan definitely has taken that into consideration. Yeah. That and and we're talking like it's starting in August. So this mm. thing is happening. It's not a proposal. What's it's, that? Uh, this concussion study. Oh, with, the, oh, the study. Okay. It's it's not like a proposal. It's happening. Okay. So if we're gonna build a new stadium, that's it will go hand in hand. Absolutely. So sorry about that. Anyways. Oh no, you're good. Mm. You're good. Uh, Heard yeah. it here first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we're diving into something we've talked about a bunch of times on here, and that yeah, is sure. the uh, the budget. Well, yeah. mainly the lack of one, yeah. and you know the times that. And Depending, then yeah, no, no. Definitely. Then now we yeah. Depending on how you look at it now, it's like. He didn't actually sign it, right? So it's just it, it's, it's there. It's getting better, we'll, right? Uh, it's better than I I'll guess over, nothing. I'll go over it with you as best I can. Yeah. So give uh, us a summary of your article. Let, all right. Let the so people know. Summary of my article is: I talked to Ken Kaiser, okay, uh, our sure, treasurer and CFO. Great guy to talk to. Very informative and and open to information as well. So I was just talking about our operational budget and where we stand. And uh, we all know about Tom Corbett's almost fifty percent educational cut back in two thousand eleven. Mm-hmm. I was actually just talking to a public education activist today. I forget where he's from, but he's on uh, the end of uh, of Montgomery, and he was talking about how of the billion dollars that Tom Corbett cut in the state, 25% of it actually came from the city of Philadelphia. So among all of that, we're talking about public education at the elementary level, middle school level, high school, and then secondary education when it comes to higher education. Mm-hmm. So we've been at $139 million uh, from state appropriations. And that was a fixed rate that we agreed on for the next four years since 2011. Governor Tom Wolf uh, made a, we lost about $30 million. So if we're at 139 now, in 2010, we might have been at like anywhere between 170 and 180. I didn't actually look at the numbers that far back, mm-hmm. but uh, that's what Ken Kaiser told me. He wa- that Tom Wolf wanted to restore over the next two years, approximately 30 million. So we only got a five percent increase in 2014, 2015, and according to Kaiser, that's good because that means that the new governor is driving public education, and that's something that he definitely believes in. Uh, it's something that he was. One of his platforms coming into the uh, governor's race, and he is providing on it now with the whole uh, natural gas tax. That then, I don't know how everything's going with fracking, sure. but mm-hmm. I do know that he is trying to get public education funding back up. Uh, I think he recognizes that Temple in the city of Philadelphia is more of a uh, communal. Uh, university, because I think if you talk to the people who go to St. Joe's, uh, Villanova, I don't know if anyone considers it a Philadelphia school or not, but it is. Oh, we had that talk on here. I'm just saying to say that Villa- Villanova is a Philadelphia school is not as like people just. You know, I mean, if you're from California. Of course, Villanova is in Philadelphia. You're, right, you're thirty. Right, and I look com- ten minutes down the street from Villanova, and I and the people ask me where are you from. I say Philadelphia because yeah. who the heck knows where where, Radner where, where yeah right. Radnor is. So I think uh, Governor Tom Wolf understands how we are a city powerhouse in comparison to the city six. You know, the yeah. kids from the south aren't getting involved in the community. That's why I don't agree with like the gentrification thing of last time because we are bringing in the entire community, which is now. A majority of black people now than it used to be it used to be a majority of white now there are more black people in Philadelphia yeah and I think it's at like a 46% rate so but where this all where, where all that ties into is state funding uh, we moved to a decentralized uh, budget model which basically is a put it on your back type of uh, philosophy where we're not we're looking to the inside on how to fundraise mm-hmm. and I think Tom Wolf saw that and I think he's trying to expand what we're trying to do. Now, we got a 5% increase. We're now asking for the second half of that $30 million boost. So you could have said that maybe you would have given us $15 million this year and $15 million next year. It only came out to be like 5%. So the 17.2% increase, or 17.3, is going to come out to like $25 million, wow. which I don't know if 
the budget's going to be able to deliver on that. Yeah. But it's something that Tom Wolf said that he would do for Temple to restore the $30 million that we lost. Interesting. So do you know if this will have any effect on Temple's finances kind of going forward? I know without a budget, they were right. saying tuition would have to go up now that they have a little bit of an influx of money. Do, right. What, what's kind of the state of all their payments and all their line items? Well, because we went to the decentralized budget uh, model, we're still I, – I, I don't foresee tuition going up terribly, although I do think it will go up just with inflation. Yeah, I mean, adding... it seems like it always goes up. Well, not even that. Well... <laughs> yeah. I know. It's almost they like... Never, they never come out, right? They never come out and say, guys, good news, tuition's going down <laughs> this year. It's like, it's like cigarettes. Have you ever right. seen cigarettes come down in price? No. No. They yeah, always exactly. go up. And they try to stay as low as possible. Right. It's not like gas or milk. Yeah. You know, it doesn't fluctuate. Normally it stays... Or in you know, Hawaii, it's like $8 to get like a yeah. gallon of milk. Yeah, exactly. So we're trying to avoid that, but... Um, we also have a low endowment fund, which I'm writing about next week. That also has a lot to play into it. Because That's really interesting to me I, because I've often thought of that. You know, you look at other um, uh, universities, right? I mean, oh. first of all, you can't you can't compare it to like a Harvard where we're talking like billions. But I mean, ours is only a couple hundred million dollars, right? Yeah. And and you look at other universities and you say, why, why, why well, is that? Like, we do have there are wealthy donors that. That are from Temple, but why aren't they giving? Well, because there's not as many wealthy donors. Also, we are a commuter school, regardless of what a lot of people think. I mean, I know we actually this year we broke the record for freshman uh, enrollment. R- living on campus. Well, like, or I, I don't exactly okay. know, but freshmen starting at Temple, okay. which is yeah. a big deal okay, yeah. to yeah. kind of counteract because I, I'll be honest, I'm a transfer student. Okay. I just, I just moved in January 1st. Oh, wow. So, I am just another one of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I don't necessarily have as much of an attachment to Temple as if I did if I moved here when I was 17 and right out of high school. Yeah. If that were to be the case Mm -hmm. and I were to be a millionaire, I know I'd be giving back. Mm -hmm. But because I've had so many different people influencing me, Temple's only a percentage, not maybe so much the entire thing. And I think that's why you see the endowment fund being kind of low. And then that provides a margin of excellence. So when we see a new football stadium, a new library, uh, the the rowing and crew team getting a new uh, house. Uh, where is this money coming from? You know, if, if you don't have millionaires, as you say, donating back to the school, you know, Temple wants to compete. We are in the United States. We're ranked 209th in our endowment fund. You, you, you're right. You can't compare to the Ivy League school. So Penn has yeah. an enormous, yeah. but they're also a private institution. Right, exactly. And they're an Ivy League school. Right. Mm-hmm. Now compare us to Pitt. That's definitely a comparable school. How do, we, how, do we, how do we compare to Pitt? Do you know? We don't. We, <laughs> yeah. Pitt is 26th in the nation, including, including schools from Canada and Puerto Rico. Wow. I could easily 26th, see that. 26th, and we're talking about Toronto universities on there. Yeah. Places in Ottawa are on there. Uh, we're 209th. Pitt's 26th in yeah. the nation. Yeah, that's insane. So we do not compare. Uh, places like Bryn Mawr College have a significantly higher endowment fund than we do. And we have maybe two or three more times the students. Right. Um, Dickinson College, an even smaller school, has a bigger endowment f- fund than us. So wow. that all plays into the budget because we're trying to do so much. And an endowment really does create a margin of excellence. Yeah. Absolutely. And so where if there's no endowment, where are we getting the money to uh, build up our school? And it's coming from Temple University in whatever facet you think that is, whether it's the students, the faculty, TSG, tuition, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, all of our numbers are rising except our, our budget. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, there's a lot to there's a lot going on and it's way more complicated than this radio interview is going to yeah. point <laughs> out. But so I mean I'm not that well versed, you know, okay. in all this budget talk. But I mean I guess Well neither am I. I mean <laughs> I just started this. So That's true. I mean you're only getting here in January and you're already talking about the budget. Are you from Pennsylvania? I am. I'm okay. from an hour north. So okay. I understand okay. what's going okay. on in the tri state area in general, how education's been cut. So I understand that part. Yeah, no, I think it's just really interesting to focus on everything that's kind of happened, right? Because I think, um, you know, I, I wrote about this. We had to write an opinion piece for class. And I I, talk, sure. I picked the Pennsylvania budget, and I said, you know, I think that oh, at this point— Oh, it's a strange point, bird. Yeah, and I, th- I said at this point, 
the the notion that Tom Wolf can or or that Tom Corbett can be you know just just you know lambasted for what he did in cutting education when Tom Wolf he's had budgets he could have signed in budgets to fund education there were budgets that he vetoed where there was funding like he didn't have to line item veto that and so I said. You know, if Tom, if you thought Tom Wolf killed education, or if you thought Tom Corbett killed education, Tom Wolf was on the on the path of murdering it. And you know and, what? And that's the thing with about partisan politics. Um, like I said, I don't actually have any real political uh, standpoint, but I do know that Tom Wolf didn't sign off on the budget because it was a Republican crafted yep. uh, mm-hmm. bill. What does that mean? I'm not exactly sure. I think the focal point on it is that conservatives normally don't, uh, and that, I think this is more of a public perception than an actual one, that they don't support education. Right. So I think when Tom Wolf didn't see the increases in the educational budget that he wanted, I think that was one of the big things that held this off. So yeah, you're right, but also the Republicans could have done a little bit more wagering as well. So this 38-week 38 38 week impasse was its own animal, and who... Who really knows how it started and ended, really? Yeah. I mean, it ended with Tom Tom Wolf not killing it again. Right. And just letting it go into law. The so pocket you, veto. Yes, yeah, so you can just, you know, yeah, crafty give a little, little bit of tool. credit there. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I guess if you want to go that far, we'll give him a little bit of credit. Well, Dominic, thanks so much for coming in. We appreciate it.